So today what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at a limit and what is a limit, all of the different things that limits can tell us and how they are useful for examining functions and their continuity. Uh, we're going to start with a fairly simple example first. We're going to start with f of x equal to x squared and we're interested in what's happening at x equal to 2. And we picked a very obvious graph to start with. We all know that the x squared parabola Here's a picture of what it looks like. So if I just want to know what's happening here at x equal to 2, I could simply hit trace and plug in 2, which we already knew was going to be 4, and kind of have this idea of what's going on with this function. And just a little reminder from pre-calculus, this is a continuous function. No holes, gaps, breaks. You can draw it from beginning to end with your, without picking up your pencil. Um, so the first thing is it says go to x equal to 2 and see what y value you end up with. So we would say f of 2 is 4. Nice and easy. We've looked at the graph and the coordinates of our location. So we would have 2, 4 as our coordinates. Remember that your points are always kind of listed as your x and then your y, which is also known as f of x. And what we want to know is we want to know is there anything, any x value where this function can't go, which is another way of saying is, is f of x undefined? Sorry, helps if I'm paying attention to what I'm saying here. Is f of x undefined for any x? And again, simple question because we're very familiar with this, and the answer is no. And the idea is, is that what we want to do is kind of have this idea of traveling along the curve. That if I'm taking a look at the graph here, and as I'm traveling along the curve, then every x that I kind of go through on the x-axis has a y value. And it continuously is connected from beginning to end. Okay. Now, one of the things that we want to kind of talk about and kind of start introducing this idea of continuity is if f of 2 equals 4, then we can definitely make the conclusion that f of 2 exists. Now, f of any x value exists for this function, but specifically since we're looking at 2. Another thing that we want to kind of take a look at is we want to take a look at both the left and the right of the function right at x equal to 2. And what we want to do is we want to kind of examine what's going on there. Now, when I'm looking at the function and kind of examining that value, let's see how I can get to my calculator here, that if I'm examining this value and taking a look at it, then what you want to be able to do is to say, well, as x approaches 2, what's happening? So as x approaches 2, we're going to actually approach 2 from below. And when we talk about approaching it from below, really a lot of times we will hear us say from the left, because you're coming from negative infinity, which is out here on the left and up. And then we'll talk about approaching your 2 from above, which for our terminology we'll call that from the right, because you're coming over here from positive infinity and heading over. So as you examine what's happening to the function as the x values get closer and closer to 2, we look at the y values and we see that from the right, they're getting closer and closer to this 4. So they appear at 6, 5, and 4 coming down. And as you come from the left, your function is coming in and heading in this direction, again heading toward 4. And that's kind of the idea of what we are talking about here is we're examining as the x value goes to a certain location, what are the y values doing? And so the idea here is, in layman's terms, we would say as x approaches 2 from the right, y approaches 4, or heads toward 4. And as x approaches 2 from the left, y is also approaching 4, and that doesn't surprise us because this is a continuous function. Um, and, and kind of some of what you're seeing here is going to be the idea of how we determine if a function is continuous. We'll do a little bit more formal definition in just a moment. 
and again, just kind of getting our terminology down, when I refer to a location, we are typically talking about the x value. And that's the as x approaches 2 part up here. If we talk about the point or the coordinate that's in that location, then we actually want to do the ordered pair. Remember, it's x, f of x, and again, f of x is another name for y. And you want to kind of pay attention to what they're asking you for. When I start asking what the function is doing itself, I am going to be asking you for the behavior of the y value over here. This is the behavior of the graph. The y is approaching 4. Okay, now we're going to look at another example where there's something a little bit more interesting going on. Uh, we'd like to figure out what's going on at x equal to 1. And so we're going to do the same thing that we kind of started with. I'm going to go ahead and just try plugging in g of 1. And what the very first thing is you're going to look at is you'll see you have this in the denominator that this is undefined. That you have a division by 0 problem, uh, which is causing a domain restriction. So it's not defined, so I can't really tell what's happening at x equal to 1 by just plugging it in. So I want to be able to explore it, and we're going to look at it a couple different ways, and this is something that we've learned last year in pre-calculus. We always look at things kind of graphically, numerically, verbally, and algebraically. And so in the first example, just plugging it in and then looking at the graph, we were able to kind of see what was going on with that. Uh, we're going to introduce a couple different ways to take a look at it when we can't plug it in. We're going to look at the graph, we're going to look at the table, which is the numeric representation, and then we'll talk about how to deal with it algebraically a little bit as well today. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to pull it up on my calculator and let's graph that one. So I'm going to turn off the first one, turn on the second one, and take a look at the graph just to kind of see what's going on. And we get what appears to be a straight line. And just like we said, if I hit trace and I try to plug in the value that we're interested in, which is at 1, and you'll notice you have it's completely undefined here. So on the graph, now sometimes you know you're looking at this, I'm doing tick marks of 1. It sort of appears as you look here that you are the y value is 0, even though there, there's no point there. Remember your calculator is not going to actually show you the whole. You can so this is the graphical representation, and you can take a look at it. We can also look at this in the table. So if you'll notice, I'm gonna hit second so I can go up here and go to the table setup. I'm interested in what's happening at x equal to 1, and I want to know where the y values are going. I'm going to start by doing point 0.1 here. When I go to look at the table, what that allows me to do is have this idea that as x approaches 1 from the left, so that would be from below, notice that I'm here at 0 0.5, negative 1, 0 0.6, negative 0.8. I say as I get closer and closer and closer to 1, what are the y values doing? They're at negative 1, coming up, coming up, coming up, and you, know, you have this idea that they are appearing to go to 0. And then you look over on the other side, and you examine the same thing. So that's coming from the right. As you come down, you look at your table and you say, well, hey, they're coming down lower, lower, and lower, and it does appear that they kind of will meet in the middle. You do want to kind of get in the habit. Let's go back to table set, start at 1 again, and let's make our increment a little bit smaller. Let's see if we can kind of get a better idea, zoom in and see where we're actually going. So we do point zero, let's do two zeros in there. Now when I take a look at the table, and you look at it again, again we see the same behavior, we're getting closer and closer together, and you can kind of get this idea that, hey, I am headed pretty close to zero. And kind of the trick of a calculator, eventually it will start rounding for you. I'm going to do this at one, and maybe do... Let's put in, I don't know, five or six zeros, and then a one. And let's see what happens when I look at it there. Now notice that what happened, you're like, hey, it's always a one and always zero. That is not necessarily true. Look at what's actually showing down here. Your calculator only has so much space. It'll round these values. Don't tell me that this is one. This is this point nine 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 six. So you can see that as x is getting extremely close to one, and you're like, well, hey, it's equal to zero, but not necessarily. These, when you are looking at them, depending on kind of how you have set your calculator up, this is a rounding error that they had. It's not really zero. It's just so close to zero that the calculator can't tell the difference when it's looking at it. And so that's kind of why when you're looking at it, I think eventually, like up here, you see that it's actually 
this decimal where you have the times 10 to the negative 6, which is your scientific notation. So you do want to be a little careful when you're looking at it. But the nice thing is, is when we're kind of investigating this what happens as we get there kind of idea. Let's see, where am I? Here's where the 1 is that this will almost tell you what the limit is, because if you zoom in far enough, you get this rounding, and it rounds right to what your limit is, which is actually kind of nice. All right, so what we would basically say here is that so we, our function was undefined at 1, but we still have this idea of what the behavior is. So as x approaches 1 from the left and from the right, then your y values are approaching 0. And what this kind of idea tells you is that this is kind of indication that you have what is called a point discontinuity. It's also called a removable point discontinuity. We'll talk about removable in just a second. And what you see on the graph is this idea that the graph is, has a hole in it. So the actual picture of what we would look at with this graph would be that um, you have this at 1, you would have a hole located here, and then the graph kind of came down in this fashion and it was linear. Now that's kind of the graphical representation and the numeric representation. Here's your graph, you can look at the graph and see what your limit is. The table representation was on your calculator when we were looking at the from the left and from the right kind of seeing what happens on either side. I usually don't like to stay zoomed in that much. You, like I said, usually you don't want to go too far. Let's try only put in three zeros here and see what we have. Oops. And so usually that gives you kind of a better idea and you can see the approaching zero on either side here. So that's your numeric representation. Now what I'd like to do is kind of think about this algebraically as well. Um, before we do this kind of algebraically, well actually let's go ahead and do it on the previous page. The algebraic part of it, which is something that's going to be important in this, you'll notice that this top, it, it factors a little bit. So if I were to take this function, g of x, and factor it completely, I'll pull the 2 out, and that will leave you with x squared minus 2x plus 1, which is x minus 1 squared over x minus 1, and you see that you have a common factor. So this can be reduced to 2 times x minus 1 or 2x minus 2, which is this line. But then remember that we like to kind of put in that there was a domain restriction. x could not equal 1 because it causes division by 0 in the original. And that's where this hole is coming from when you look at it. Now, the idea then is this trying to understand the behavior of a function at a certain value. It's insufficient to just plug things in. You're not just going to be able to evaluate the function and figure out what's going on. Sometimes you have to look at what's happening on either side of it. That what's happening as you approach the x value that you're interested in. This is what we're going to call a limit, and then we'll introduce some limit notation as well. Uh, the idea is, is that it doesn't really matter how close you get to the edge of the bridge. You can tell what's going on simply by being close or close enough. Like if you had a little person standing up here on the bridge or over on this side, doesn't really matter, looking over, they can clearly see that you have a gorge down here that you're looking at. Even if you would extend the bridge over and they could move a little closer this way, the closer you get, you slow it down, you can see that you have a gorge. It doesn't really matter whether the bridge goes all the way across, whether it stops. You're really just kind of approaching the edge to kind of look at and see what's happening at that place. Okay. All right, so let's take a look at uh, example three on here. Now I'm going to let you, I'm going to pause for just a second, and I'm going to let you take a look at, again, a very simple example, a line continuous, and we say there's a gorge at x equal to 1. So what I want you to do is to use your calculator, do a quick graph, although you should be able to do it without a calculator, and use your table to show what's going to happen on the table and show how the limit is approaching, and then tell me what the limit is. We'll come back in just a second and we'll talk about how to write it as one-sided limits. What you're going to do first is simply write as x approaches 1 
from the left, y approaches, and you'll fill in the number here, and then we'll do as x approaches 1 from the right, y approaches and fill in the number there, and then we'll come and kind of discuss how the notation is going to work. So I will pause it and give... Okay, so after you've done your exploration, what you should come up with, here's your nice graph, and again we can kind of, in this case because it's continuous, we can hit trace, we can see that we're at 4, we can see the functions coming in from the left and the right and heading toward 4. Here we are in the table of values, getting closer and closer from the left, going up to 1, from the right, going down to 1, and we can see that we're headed toward 4 as well. So this is kind of the idea of what we're looking at, this idea that we can look at where we're approaching, and again we're using simple functions to start with. Now, in general, we want to write this kind of using some notation that's here. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about each one and then discuss how to write it. Now, from the left, I'll just write it above right here. Usually when you do limit notation, you write LIM, which is really shorthand to say, hey, I'm doing a limit. Right below the limit, you tell me where X is going. So X goes to 1, and they always kind of go right on top of each other. Then you usually have to put what goes here, the argument is going to be the function that you're dealing with. Now, you can either put the actual function name, which we had named it f of x, so we can type f of x there, or you can put in your 2x plus 2 there as well. I'll do the bottom one with the 2x plus 2. And so what this is, it was, they're saying what they want you to do is find the limit as x approaches 1. Now I need the from the left. Now from the left, that's over here on this side, that's down here at negative infinity. So what they do is they put a little superscript of a minus right there on the 1. So that's the limit as x approaches 1 from the left on this function. This is what it's telling you what you're supposed to do. Now the actual answer is, well, where is the function going as I get close to negative 1 from the left? The answer is it's going to 4. And so we do equals 4. Because I know y is approaching 4, which is what we had here, but the limit, which is what we're actually finding here, is 4, so that's why it's an equals there. From the right, you use the same notation, limit as x approaches 1. Now from the right, we're at positive infinity and heading down toward it, so we put a superscript of a plus over here on the 1. And again, you would put your function, in this case I'll just show you how to do it this way, you would put the function in as itself, and you would say it's equal to 4. You must have an argument in your limit. It has to have something here and here, because you've got to know what function you're taking the limit of, or you're investigating and exploring kind of the behavior of the graph. Now, notice that in this case, you know, this is a pretty special function, that in this function we have this left-hand limit, which is what this one is called, left-hand limit, and over here, this is called your right-hand limit. And in this function, they are exactly the same value. Now, it doesn't always happen. Uh, it does in this function because it's continuous. So really, this idea is, is that if you have a left and a right-hand limit, if you, the precipice is approaching and going to meet in the middle, where it's going to be a good bridge, then what we say is that the limit, in general, will exist. You have to be going to the same y value from the left and the right. So what we would do is we would then rewrite this as the limit as x approaches 1. We would not put any superscript here at all. We would just simply do of f of x equals 4, which would tell us that there's no superscript here, that both the left and the right were exactly the same value that you were the y values were approaching. And now what this does give us, kind of before we go to the next page, which is the summary, is this idea of what makes a continuous function. So first off, for a function to be continuous, you would probably have to agree that the function value itself, uh, we'll say f of 1 in this case, it has to exist, which means it has to be defined. If I plug in 1 into the function, I should get a y value back, and specifically in this case, we got f of 1 was 4. So that's case number 1, but that is actually not enough for continuity because you could exist but the problem is you could have some kind of a jump or something going on where you're defined elsewhere than what the function is. So the second part of continuity that you're going to be looking for is this idea that where is the left and the right piece of the function heading toward. So 
the second part is going to be that the limit as x approaches this value has to exist. So the limit as x approaches 1 of f of x must exist. Okay, and then what we learned there is how do we know that the limit exists? Well, the limit exists if and only if the limit as x approaches 1 from the left of the function has to equal the same thing as the limit as x approaches 1 from the right of the function. It has to be the same number. And in this case, both of them are equal to 4, so we meet that requirement. Now, there is a third requirement here that we'll kind of add in for continuity, and that third requirement, because you can have these two be met, but yet have a function that is not continuous, because I can have a function that comes along that has a limit, because you can have a point discontinuity and have a limit, and have it defined somewhere else. So the only way for it to actually be continuous is this point has to actually be filled in where the whole location is. So the third condition for continuity is going to be that your f of that value, when I plug 1 in, I have to get the same thing that I get when I calculate the limit of that function, that they have to be exactly the same. And in this case, they are because they're all equal to 4. And so those are the three requirements for continuity. So quick summary of kind of what we've talked about so far. You have a left limit and a right-hand limit, and if those are exactly the same number or value that the y value are, is approaching, this, is, this little symbol here means if and only if. So if this part is true, if the left and the right-hand limits are the same, then the limit exists and it is that value. If the limit exists and is some value L, then you know the left and the right-hand limits. And then here is that recap of our definition of continuity that the function is defined at the value, the limit exists, and the limit and the function value are exactly the same. I'm going to put a big kind of circle around this one. This is going to be an important thing. There will be a free response question in AP Calculus where you will have to address the con continuity of a function at a point. And in your free response, in your kind of essay that you're going to write to answer the question in this, that part of the free response, you have to make sure that you address and state that the function is defined and tell me what it is, what the y value is. You have to talk about the fact that the limit exists, which means you have to do both the limit as x approaches c from the left, and you have to talk about the limit as x approaches c from the right, and then you have to discuss the fact that number one and number two are equal to each other. And so in order to get your full credit or your full points for that free response, you will have to address all of those items. In layman's terms, we're basically saying a function is only continuous at a point if the function value and the limit value are the same. Now, but this is AP, so you're going to have to be very methodical and make sure you address the three points as you're doing it. For example, here in 4, this function is definitely a continuous function. And we want to kind of talk about the continuity of the function and draw the picture, look at the table, and all that stuff to investigate it. But if I really wanted to talk about the continuity at x equal to 2, I would first go, well, what is f of 2? Can you plug 2 in? The answer is yes. 2 squared minus 4, or 2 squared minus 5 is negative 1. So f of 2 exists. That's your criteria number one. Notice I'm writing it down because in the AP, if you don't write it, you don't get credit for it. The second thing I need to discuss is the limits. So I need to think about the limit as x approaches 2 from the left of your function, x squared minus 5. I need to address the limit as x approaches 2 from the right of x squared minus 5. And I'm going to use the calculator in order to find those. So when we take a look, here's our nice graph of our parabola over here. I'm graphing it on your calculator. I hit trace, plug in 2, I get my negative 1. Over here, I look at my table of values and I look at the graph and I can see that we're heading toward a y value of negative 1, just before. So we'll go ahead and add that in. So this is going to be negative 1 and negative 1. They are both the same. Therefore, we can conclude the limit as x approaches 2 of this function, x squared minus 5, exists and is negative 1. 
Okay, so that meets two of the criteria for our continuity. And then how do I make my final conclusion that this is a continuous function? The third criteria, which should be fairly obvious since I'm picking such nice functions here to start with, is that my f of 2 is exactly the same as my limit as x approaches 2 of x squared minus 5. And when all of these three conditions are met, we get to conclude f of x is continuous at x equal to 2. All right, now let's look at one that's a little bit more interesting. So here, I'm going to let you give you a chance to kind of work through it and play around with this yourself uh, and pause it. But what I want you to do is I want you to take a look at this and I want you to take about the three criteria that we're looking at. Now this one is a little bit different. Um, let's talk about continuity second. First, let's just have you talk about coming up with a limit. So I want you to graph it on your calculator. Use the graph and the table to talk about the limit as x approaches 1 from the left of f of x and the limit as x approaches 1 from the right of f of x by looking at the graph and by looking at the table and kind of jotting down those two things. So I'll pause it for a moment and let you do that. Okay, here's a picture of our graph. And again, don't think all rational functions end up being linear. We're just working with some very simple ones. Uh, if I hit trace and I'm interested at 1 and we type it in, you notice there is no value there doesn't even give me a flashing little dot because it's not defined. It does not exist. The function itself does not exist for x equal to 1. However, I can see from the graph that the left and the right limits are going to end up being the same here. So if I set up my table, let's start here at 1. And again, I, don't, I like to, as my default, kind of leave this 10 to the negative 4 in here. Take a look at my table and take a look at the values. You can clearly see here that the y values are getting closer and closer to 4 from either side, from the left, from below, from the right, from above. We're approaching 4. Even though there's an error there, the limit does exist. So if we take a look back here, we can go ahead and fill in our left-hand limit and our right-hand limit is 4. Now let's talk about the continuity of this particular function. Is this function going to be continuous? The picture looks continuous, but the answer is no. f of x is not continuous at x equal to 1, and what was the criteria that kind of failed? Here, this was the second criteria, which tells us that the limit as x approaches 1 of f of x exists because the left and the right hand limits were the same, and it happens to be equal to 4. However, it's not continuous at x equal to 1 because we failed the first criteria, which is f of 1 does not exist because it was undefined. It causes division by 0. And kind of this idea is that we want to get out of this is what does this information tell you about the function? Like if I only knew these two pieces of information, what would that tell me about the function? It would tell me that there is a point discontinuity on the function or the fact that there is a hole in the graph. It's how I would know the behavior of the function by looking at the limits and the existence of the function value. Okay, so now we're going to talk about a little bit, kind of play around with some more rational functions. Um, this one right here, let's talk about the algebra method. These functions, they factor, and there's some simplification that we can do. And there's this idea that if I want to calculate a limit on a function, if I can simplify f of x and then use that function, that would help me determine the limit. So the algebraic method looks something like this. It would say the limit as x approaches 1 of our 2x squared minus 2 over x minus 1. I'm going to go ahead and just put the whole function in. I can calculate that limit, and, and there's a lot of writing in calculus. You just have to get used to bringing things along. I can calculate this limit by simply changing the form of this. I'm going to factor the top. The top factors, pull the 2 out, x squared minus 1, so x plus 1, x minus 1. And I see the same thing that occurred in a previous example is that we now have this cancellation of terms. So I can remove 
the division by zero problem. What I get is a function that is essentially the same everywhere as the original function except for the fact that there's no hole in it. And because of that, what that does is that tells us that we can actually now calculate the limit by looking because the left and the right hand pieces are going to follow this function. Even though at x equal to 1, this function and this function are not the same, when we're doing the limit, we only care about what happens on the left and what happens on the right. So I can use this simplified function in order to calculate it, and really you can just plug in and say, well, you get 2 times 1 plus 2, and the answer is 4. Notice that here I'm taking the limit of this function. I'm required to bring the notation. I haven't figured out the limit yet. I'm just working with the algebra. I still bring the limit with me. I still bring the limit with me over here because I haven't actually taken a limit yet. I haven't actually figured out what it is. I've just simplified my function. And then once you actually say, hey, I can calculate the limit, I figure out what the limit is, the limit is 4, that's when you lose the notation going down. Now, one of the things that's kind of worth noting about this is that if a function is continuous, at a certain point, continuous at x equal to c, then kind of going the reverse of trying to prove something is continuous, what we know is the limit as x approaches c of that function is nothing more than plugging it in. That's kind of the, hey, that's what continuity gives us. If we know it's continuous to start with, then we know that we can calculate the limit simply by doing direct substitution. Now the other thing that we get out of this is that when you take a look at a function, even if it's discontinuous at, say, x equal to 1, like it is above, if it's continuous everywhere else, you can still use direct substitution. The only number that you can't use direct substitution for is x equal to 1. Everything else, you can simply just plug it in and use the idea that we know that it's continuous. It's kind of like because of the definition of continuity. Okay, now in this next example, I'm getting a lot of review from algebra in here. Um, what I want you to do is I want you to try to calculate this limit algebraically. As you are doing this limit, kind of my hint to you is you are going to need to factor the top. And you're going to start freaking out, maybe if you were, especially if you were in regular, although probably if you were in the plus classes, you're still freaking out too. You have to figure out how to factor this cubic. My hint to you going forward is think about factoring by grouping and that should help you end up with the factoring. So I'm going to pause, give you a moment, let you try to play around with the algebra of this, and then I'll come back and we can discuss the whole simplification of it. Okay, now that you've had a chance to play around with it, a couple of things that I want you to kind of notice as you take a look at my work here. Notice that I have kept the limit each time, because you have to have one of the things that's kind of true about the AP is you have to have what's called correct mathematical communication, which means if you do not write these limits here and you say that this equals and you just kind of drop this off, you will lose your points for that free response because you have not used correct mathematical communication. So you must make sure you write it. I know it's tedious, but it's just part of the training that we're going to go through. So the first thing I did is I grouped the first two together, pulled out the GCF, uh, greatest common factor of x squared pulled out the GCF of negative 4 over here. Notice that both parts have an x plus 3 in it. When you pull the x plus 3 out, you've got x squared minus 4, which then factors, I also factored the bottom. So then we take a look at it, and then I can get to this point. Now notice, I haven't done the limit. I'm algebra simplification, algebra, algebra, cancel, algebra. It's not until this step right here, once I have reduced it down to this simplified version where I have removed the discontinuity. That's what we're doing here. That's why it's called a removable discontinuity. We remove the division by zero problem. Hence the removable part. And then what's left, there's where I am ready to go ahead and do the limit by doing direct substitution because now what I know is the function that I have here is a continuous function where this one was not continuous at the x equals negative 2 because I removed the division by 0 problem. So I can now just do the direct substitution and plug it in and get my 4 thirds. 
And then just to verify, here is our graph. Again, it's hard to tell sometimes on the graph. Here's my negative 2. You've got this point. You know, you might be guessing it's negative or positive 1, positive 2. You're not really sure where that is. You take a look over here at the table. The table, while it gives you a guess that it might be around 4 thirds, you don't really know because it could be an irrational number too. And we don't really know what this decimal is. This just gets us close to it. It's the algebra that lets us find it exactly in a lot of cases. Okay, what we have here is kind of look at something a little different. We've looked at functions that are continuous. So we've looked at limits on continuous functions, or you can use direct substitution. We've looked at limits where we have a point discontinuity, or a removable point discontinuity, which is where we can actually calculate the limit by removing the factor that's causing the problem and then using the direct substitution algebraically. Now what we're going to do is we're going to look at what is basically a piecewise function. So we have a line over here for x less than negative 2, the parabola for the in-between section, and then a horizontal line, a constant function over here. And of course these do continue in both directions. And so we want to evaluate the limit as x approaches negative 2 for this function. Well, the first thing is you can kind of look at it, we'll kind of do two things. We'll do, um, look at it graphically, and then we'll also kind of write some notation down for us. So in this problem, looking at it graphically, what you're going to see is that as you approach negative 2, so here's my negative 2, I'm coming in from either side here. And what I notice is that here's my left piece, and over here is the right piece. In other words, on either side of the negative 2. And I take a look at the left piece, and so I say, well, what's the limit as x approaches negative 2 from the left for this function? Well, because it's piecewise, essentially what we're going to be doing is I'm going to be using the piece that is to the left. The piece to the left is this x plus 2. Now, when I take a look at that piece, I, I say, well, it's continuous, right? It's a nice line, I can plug in the negative 2. Now here's where the rub is. The limit, technically it's not really continuous at negative 2 because it's not included on that left piece. However, the limit is only saying what are you approaching. What you're approaching is your 0, your y value of 0 right here. Even though f of negative 2 does not equal 0, it actually equals 2 we see that the limit on the left is approaching that zero value right there. Then I do the limit as x approaches negative 2 from the right on the function. Now I have to use the piece on the right side of negative 2. And the piece on the right side is going to be the parabola. So that's going to be the x squared over 2. Now that is continuous and it's including the negative 2, so it's direct substitution. Put in your negative 2, square it, divide by 2, you get 2. And so what we can see on this is that our left hand limit and our right hand limit, they exist. They, they both have values that we can find, but they are different values. And that's going to be our clue to us that when I see this happening, if this is the two pieces of information I know, I know that what the graph is going to exhibit is what is called a non-removable jump discontinuity. Now the other thing that this is going to tell us is that this limit right here, this limit does not exist. In order for the limit to exist, remember both the left and the right hand limit had to be the same value. So we would simply write does not exist or DNE is our little shortcut for that. So the limit itself as x approaches 2 doesn't exist because it's not going to the same place. So and then also in terms of our continuity then this, of course, would fail to be continuous. f of x is not continuous because the limit, or not continuous at x equal to negative 2, because the limit as x approaches negative 2 does not exist. All right, now let's take a look at a different one. Same function, but now we're going to approximate the limit as x approaches 2. Now as x approaches 2, we see that, oh look, the two pieces here, as x approaches 2, there's my 2, the two pieces, they kind of meet right here in the middle. So when I'm evaluating this limit, 
we say, all right, the limit as x approaches 2 from the left of this function. To do this, we would use the piece of the function to the left. The piece to the left of 2 is the parabola, so that's the x squared over 2. And then we can calculate the limit. We can go ahead and just plug it in, so we would end up with our 2. We also do the limit as x approaches 2 from the right of f of x. And in that piece, you have to use the piece on the right, which is the constant function. And what do you do when you're doing a constant function? What does it approach? Well, what is it always? Always 2. So that equals 2. So our limit itself is 2. We already concluded that f of 2 was 2. And then notice that right here, we can discuss the continuity of this at x equal to 2 and negative 2, which is what we did earlier. For x equal to 2, I know that f of 2 exists. I know the limit as x approaches 2 of f of x exists, because both the left and the right. And then we know that number 3, f of 2 was 2, and so was the limit as x approaches 2 of f of x. I have met all three criteria. If they ask you to discuss the continuity, you have to discuss all three. Then you get to conclude f of x is continuous at x equal to 2. Now up here for the negative 2, the first criteria is met. f of negative 2 exists. The problem with this one is that the limit as x approaches 2 of f of x does not exist. This is where it fails its continuity. Even though the function value exists, the left and the right hand limits were not the same. So we would say f of x is not continuous at x equals negative 2 because the limit as x approaches 2 of f of x does not exist. Okay, so examples of where we can look at continuity, we can use the function value and the limits, left and right hand limits, to help us kind of classify the type of discontinuities. And we've looked at the removable point discontinuity, non-removable jumps, we've looked at how to tell if it's continuous at that point, uh, but there's a third type of discontinuity you should be familiar with, and that is the uh, infinite, non-removable infinite discontinuity. And what's happening on the graph there is this idea of vertical asymptotes. And now these are a little different than what we've been doing. Limits do have kind of an additional caveat that we probably should be talking about, and that limit only exists if the limit the y value is approaching an actual number. So the limit as x approaches some number c of f of x only exists if the left and the right hand limits, the limit as x approaches c from the left has to be the same as the limit as x approaches c from the right, and it has to actually be some real number. And if it's not some real number, then the limit does not exist. And so this is where our limits going with these vertical asymptotes are going to not exist. The fact is, is that if you have a vertical asymptote, and we're going to use this example down here to take a look at it. Uh, 1 over x minus 3, very simple graph. You should know what that looks like. has a vertical asymptote here at 3. And then the graph, 1, 2, 3. And it simply is our nice little hyperbola with a horizontal asymptote at the x-axis. And if you don't remember that, you need to kind of go back and do a little review of your algebra. Now, and in looking at this and kind of discussing it, on either side, if I'm on the left side, kind of approaching here, what are the y values doing? Well, they're going down to negative infinity. They're kind of bending because of the vertical asymptote. And then over here on the right side, as you are coming in from the right side heading in, the y values are going up to infinity. And so what this tells us is anytime we're trying to calculate a left or right hand limit, if it either goes up or down to positive or negative infinity, that's telling us that there's a vertical asymptote there. And, and so it's 
pretty uh, straightforward, but the other thing is it also tells you that the limit does not exist. So right here, just like for part A, the limit as x approaches 3 of 1 over x minus 3, we would say does not exist. The reasons that we're saying it does not exist, you only need one, you don't need both. But we'll go ahead and put the both the left and the right hand limits. The limit as x approaches 3 from the left of f of x is going down to negative infinity. And the limit as x approaches 3 from the right of that function is going to infinity. So it's going down. And so that is why we would say that the limit itself does not exist. Now, what's kind of interesting about this is when you're looking at, say, the second example. Again, another function that you should be familiar with and kind of take a look at is this um, 1 over x minus 3 squared. Squaring it doesn't do anything other than flips your pieces up. You still have your asymptote there. You still have your horizontal asymptote. And then our graph essentially is just now going to be something along these lines. And you can graph that on your calculator and verify. Now again, we're going to end up with a limit that doesn't exist. And you would be tempted, and this is kind of the mistake that I see at times, is that when I'm doing this limit, you would think that it exists because well, it goes to the same spot. Both the left, limit as x approaches 3 from the left of this function is infinity and the limit as x approaches 3 from the right is infinity as well. And you're like, hey, it goes to the same place, so therefore the limit exists. But remember, there's going to be this additional caveat if they have to go to the same place, it has to go to a single real number. And infinity is not a number, it's a destination, so we would say it does not exist. Now, before I move on to the last types of discontinuity, I want to kind of go back and look at what the tables look like when you have your infinite and your jump discontinuities. So let's take a look here. Here's your jump discontinuity that we have graphed here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at my table and let's look at that negative 2. So I'm going to set my table up. I'm going to put in negative 2. And we're going to look at what happens right before and right after negative 2. So in the table, uh, now this one because it's in pieces, you have to kind of work with me a little bit. Uh, what you'll see is here's the two pieces. Here's the left piece. I have that in Y7. Here's the right piece over here in Y8. So you kind of have to go here, here's the negative 2, and then here's the other side. And you can see that this negative 2 from the left, as we're coming down, getting closer and closer from the left, if you look at these values, they're getting closer and closer to 0. Scientific notation, getting smaller and smaller. Over on the right side, if I scroll down to the right side, Over here, we see that the values over here, the y values, are getting closer and closer to 2. So we get this idea that they're going to different places, which we don't see if we go over here to our positive 2, which we were looking at, and I take a look. Now in that one, I need to scroll over a little bit because we have y8 and y9 are my 2. move up just a little bit and then move over. Okay, so here's my left side heading toward 2. Here's my right side. It looks like it's already at 2, but again, remember, pay attention, put your cursor over it. It's probably a rounding. Oh, that's right, it's constant on that side. I totally forgot what I was doing. So it's 2 over here. This one's heading toward 2. They meet in the middle, so therefore the limit is, exists. Now what I want to do is let's take a look at the 1 over x minus 3. And I might not, I might need to put that one in here. Yeah, so let me turn off the three piecewise, the three pieces. And if you didn't know how to do this, uh, what I've done is I've used a logic to kind of get rid of the pieces that I don't want and keep the things that I do. So I divide by, because I want it to graph when x is less than negative 2, so I divide by that, because when it's true, it evaluates the 1. When it's false, it evaluates the 0. And so that will only graph the piece that I want, and I kind of graph the 3 at the same time, if you wanted to know how I did that. All right, so let's just look at the 1 over x minus 3, just as an example for this. We'll just do zoom six here. 
Alright, so here's my graph that we're looking at. Here's our nice vertical asymptote. Now what I want to do is I'm going to go to the table set. We're interested in what's happening at 3. Now here's where I want you to be careful. I'm actually going to start with just like 0.01 just to kind of see what the difference is. When you look at this originally, and if you're kind of not paying attention to this, this one is pretty obvious. You see how I'm getting more and more negative on this side. And then this side I'm getting more and more positive. They're not getting closer together. It's not like you're going to meet in the middle and the limit is zero. When you look at this, you have to notice that this one's going down to negative infinity. This one's going up to infinity, clearly going in different directions. Even if I zoom in and make it go do my normal three zeros and a one here and take a look at it. If I zoom in, I still have the same behavior. One's going to negative infinity, one's going to positive infinity, but notice how much more it's going. The more I zoomed in, the more it changed. Whereas if it was a jump discontinuity, you would zoom in, you should not see a change. You should see it going to the same numbers that it did in the previous one. So sometimes with these, you have to do a little bit extra when you're looking at it. Common mistake, uh, make sure that when you're looking at your, oh, it won't let me go that way, and go down here. I want to put the square one in there just to kind of show you again what the table is going to look like. So if I add a square here, and then I take a look at the table again around three. Now be very careful here on this one. First, what kind of notation is this? What does this mean? Is this zero again? One times 10 to the eighth? No, this is really, really big. What you'll be tempted to do, though, is when you're looking at it, is that because it looks like the same number, you might say that that is the number it's approaching. But you have to be kind of careful. Let me make it a little bit less small when you look at it. So it's 3 and 0.1. You can't just look at one table. Like You would be tempted maybe here to go, hey, this is approaching 100. It's going from 11.25 up to 100. This is going 11.25 up to 100. Hey, look, it matches it. Therefore, the limit is 100. But you have to actually do it a couple of times. I would suggest the whole zooming in process because as soon as you start zooming in, even just one more zero added in there, and then you take a look at the table, if the numbers on either side of your value change, then it's not a jump. It's going to be something where it's going to be going to infinity or negative infinity. So you do want to be careful about that. All right, now this one is going to be kind of interesting to take a look at. And I'm going to, I want you to take a moment and kind of play around with this on your calculator. This one's called an oscillating discontinuity and what I want you to do is kind of graph this, use zoom trig, make sure you're in radian mode, zoom in, play around with the table, see what you think is happening, and then come back and we will kind of discuss it together and I'll show you some examples and graphs on this one. All right, when we take a look at this one, I kind of did, I did my graphs in Mathematica just to bring them in, but I'm also going to show you looking at the table on the calculator. That kind of what you notice here, here's the original graph, just a zoom seven trig. And you've got some oscillation happening here, but it's kind of hard to see what's going on. And when you had it on your calculator, you probably saw something more along the lines of this. And you had to kind of be careful about your calculator. Calculator is a connected dot grapher. This does not stop there and have this pattern. It's plotting a couple of points and then there's not really the number of pixels in between here is not that great. So it maybe only plots uh, 100 points in here and connects it and that's just what it connected. That doesn't mean it actually has the entire picture because this is a very complicated graph. And so the first thing is you kind of want to zoom in and take a look at that. And if I zoom in, so this was negative 2 pi to 2 pi, I zoomed in to negative pi over 8, pi over 8. And notice that you kind of have the same behavior. Now it comes in over the top, but it's oscillating, 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 and so on here. And it doesn't really give us a better picture of what's going on here. And then I said, well, I'll zoom in again. So I zoomed in. I changed negative pi over 64 to pi over 64. And again, it's oscillating, oscillating, oscillating. And then even here, you see that you're starting to have trouble. What you're actually seeing here is a graph that the closer you get to zero, the faster it oscillates, going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Now, what does that show us on the table here? This is one of those things that's kind of weird if you're not aware of this oscillating discontinuity, the table can really kind of confuse you. I started at zero, I'm going by point one. 
you take a look at the table and you go, okay, let's take a look at it. Now you might be tempted to go, hey, it looks like it's going to zero because you're kind of going to 0 0.54, negative 0 0.544, and like I'm going to conclude zero. Here's the first clue that something's weird going on. Notice that here you have negatives, then you went to a positive, you increased here, and then you decreased. Hmm. So it's got this kind of, this is where you're trying to catch this oscillating nature. And then it's negative, and if you go back a few more, it'll eventually turn back to being positive. But notice it stayed negative for a really long time there. Then over the same thing over on this side, you have this where it's coming, kind of going more negative and then less negative. Because this is going down the negative infinity and coming back up. So you, you start to see a little oscillation. You might be tricked by this one. You might choose zero. If I go back to my table set and I zoom in, because that's going to be one of the things that you always want to do is zoom in. I'll just go in one. Then I take a look at my table again. Oops, I need to put my table start here at zero. Always got to reset yourself back to that. And then take a look at it. Now, notice big, big change. This one's now positive. That one's now negative. It switched the sign. If I zoom in one more time, let's make this point zero, zero, 0.001 and reset that back to zero. Take a look at your table. Now look, it switched again, negative to positive. And as I keep zooming in, what you're looking for is that you want the behavior to settle and stay somewhere. If the limit actually exists, Zooming in should not change the numbers that you see. And the fact that as I keep zooming in my delta x over here, that I keep getting radically different numbers and positives and negatives are switching is a sign that this is a limit that is oscillating, that it does not exist. So when we start discussing this limit and I say, well, what's going on? I would say the limit as x approaches 0 of sine of 1 over x, that the limit itself does not exist. Um, now, the end behavior of this function actually does exist. This is one of those kind of odd things. This will eventually, it, basically it oscillates faster close to zero, slower out on the end. And if I wanted to say what's happening, this does have a nice horizontal asymptote at zero. Okay, now hopefully kind of wrapping up this set of notes here is you're getting comfortable with this idea of a limit and how it's different from the function value that the limit doesn't care what the actual function value is at C. It only cares about what happens right before on the left and right after on the right. So if we kind of cover up what's happening at C, we would guess, okay, if I was looking at this, that the limit would be whatever this value is. I don't know what's happening behind this red bar, but I know that the limit would be whatever this Y value is. Now, the idea of the function value, okay, so this right here is the limit as x approaches c of the function. Over here, I'm kind of interested only in the function value, f of c, and in that, you cover up the left and the right. We don't care what happens at the left and the right, we only care what's happening at c. So we say, okay, what's the y value? So we would take a look at it. It's only when you put these two together, okay, so only when you put these two pieces together that you have this idea of getting the whole picture of the graph. And the fact that your limit, which is going to be up here, is not the same as your function value, which obviously was 0 down here, f of c was 0, that if you're different, the function is not continuous. And that's kind of part of what we were discussing with today. All right, so the final thing that you need to do, kind of coming into class based on this set of notes, is I've given you a graph below that has a very messy graph, lots of discontinuities. So kind of scroll down here and look at it. I would like you to kind of discuss this idea of continuity. I want you to talk about the function value at all those special places on the graph. Let's say here at negative 2, 2, 5, 6, 8, 10, and 11. You know, all those places where those discontinuities are occurring. So I want you to discuss, kind of think of the three parts of continuity, discuss the function values, that's the f of c, whether or not it exists. Then I want you to talk about the limits. So I want you to talk about the limit as x approaches c from the left. I want you to talk about the limit 
as x approaches c from the right. And then I want you to draw a conclusion based on what you get there about the limit as x approaches c itself, whether it exists or it doesn't exist, based on what you see there. And then I basically want you to go ahead and tell me about the continuity. If it's continuous, then I want you to get the, you know, there's three parts. This is part one, this is part two, and then there's a third conclusion that you would need in order to say continuity. If it is not continuous, I want you to tell me the type of discontinuity that you're looking for. And again, I want you to do it for all the discontinuities, which would be at negative two, two, five, six, eight, ten, and eleven. But I also want you to go ahead and there are two points on here that I'd like you to discuss here and here. So do x equal to zero and x equal to four as well as all the discontinuities that are there. And we will discuss this in class as kind of our class opener where you will be processing and there will be the kind of jumping off point for our class activities tomorrow. And this concludes your limit introduction.